Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you to all of our amazing alumni. I'm looking forward to being re-inspired. And we just left an unbelievable science experiment that was happening and you could have heard the drop of a pin in there, which I'm sure you experienced as students. So they have a sense of what you all experienced. So thank you for being here. Um, I, my husband, this is Shane Valentine. For those of you who've been around a while, he used to say, I'm Mr. Office at Marin Waldorf, but now he's Mr. Admissions at <laughs> Marin Waldorf. Um, so Shane is a moderator, and so he's going to moderate the panel today. So I'm going to pass the mic to Julie. I'm sure they have worked it all out. So thank you, and thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. This is the um, portion of the day where this is where it's all about. This is the questions that you have of, well, do they really function in society? <laughs> uh, so, we'll see. So, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a, uh, a couple of minutes and I'm gonna read a brief bio for each of them and then we're gonna have uh, two rounds of kind of opening questions about their experiences and then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. Does that sound fine? Okay, great. So, random order. So Jasper Van Brockel, he's with us today, uh, attended Waldorf schools in the Netherlands, uh, K through 12, where he's from. Uh, he serves, currently serves as CEO of RSF Social Finance in San Francisco and is the board chair of Gaia Herbs uh, and has also served role most recently before this uh, as CEO of Oleda North America. Uh, he has 20, over 20 years of experience um, as an executive in the natural products um, and impact investing industries. Uh, he graduated from Harvard Business School uh, management program and has a master's degree in economics uh, at Aramis University of Rotterdam. Next, we have Paulina Yampowski. Yampowski, sorry. Uh, attended Marin Waldorf uh, School from second through eighth grade. Graduate, graduating in 2002, then continued on to Marin Academy, uh, and then received a BA in psychology uh, from UCLA. Uh, she has completed a holistic health coach certification at Institute of Integrative Nutrition, has started her own business, um, is in alignment uh, in alignment with her love for science and love uh, for science, consciousness, and world service, she serves on two boards, uh, the Institute of Noetic Science in Petaluma and the Three Swallows Foundation in Virginia. Um, she is also an entrepreneur, uh, venture into um, as a certified pediatric sleep consultant, um, and she currently uh, has a second child on the way, and um, is hoping that her children will have the same experience as her. Julia McElroy is alumni of Summerfield Warlord School and Farm. Um, prior to starting law school, she taught uh, math to struggling upper grades and high school uh, students at Summerfield. Um, after becoming an attorney, she stayed connected to teaching as an adjunct professor for advanced legal writing at Empire College. She graduated honors from Mills College in, o in Oakland with a BA in political, legal, and economic analysis, and a minor in environmental studies, because. Um, she also holds a law degree from Thomas Jefferson uh, School of Law, graduating magna cum laude, with a certificate in law and social justice. Marissa Meyer, um, attended Marin Waldorf School from first to eighth grade, um, went to Summerfield for one year, but graduated Petaluma High School, went on to UCLA, majored in International Development Studies, and completed pre-medical coursework. She found inspiration for her major while on a service trip to Guatemala that she took with the eighth grade class, and she saw the economic development opportunities in villages her class worked in. 
Uh, after UCLA, she worked in finance and accounting, which included a couple years at hematology, oncology clinical trials group at UCSF. She then went on to the University of Michigan Ross School of Business to get her MBA. She's currently uh, at Deloitte doing management consulting um, and often finds the work of having to work quickly, learn new skills, industries, and functions to help her clients in this uh, in rapid formation of uh, high-performing teams and client relationships. And last but not least is Max Perry, uh, Marin Waldorf grad of 2006, kindergarten through eighth grade before going to TAM. He then went on to UC Santa Cruz for under, uh, undergraduate studies of legal undergraduate studies in legal studies, politics, and music, achieving highest honors from the political department. Um, he studied abroad in Edinburgh, working full-time as a member of the Scottish Parliament. Um, he, sorry, he's a master, and then uh, returned back and received a master's degree from the London School of e Economics focused on European foreign policy. Uh, returning to, after returning to Marin County, he served as a legislative aide to Supervisor Katie Rice of Marin County, focusing on housing and homeless policy, and then Chief of Staff of Community Action Marin, Marin's largest nonprofit agency serving low-income families and children. Um, and anyone here live in Mill Valley? Great. He is currently the candidate for March 3rd election in Mill Valley City Council. <laughs> So, right. <laughs> All right. So, what I like to do is one first round of question, uh, and it's what I'd like to get from their perspective, each of them, is the transition from a Waldorf education to mainstream. So, what was it like going to the public high school? Um, what, because the transition points are the ones that are the most curious, I feel. Um, so we'll start with those transition questions first, and I'll have each one of them talk about that experience for a couple of minutes. Uh, and then we're gonna call, come back and talk about career. So we're gonna start with uh, continuing education. So, great. Would you like to start? I will. Thank you. Thank you. So I went to Summerfield Walder from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. So my transition to more mainstream schooling wasn't until college. And, you know, in any big transition, you always are a little scared and a little worried, and will I be good enough? And it turned out that it was the smoothest transition ever. In fact, I felt like I was so overprepared that the first, I don't know, year or two of classes was just pretty boring. Um, I was surprised to find that most of my, even my smartest, most capable um, friends ha didn't have the depth of education and the requirements that I did. Um, such as reading lots and lots of books, um, writing papers, having to speak in front of classes, um, and just the richness of the education they just didn't have. And so coming from that background, it just made the transition so smooth. It was so easy to go in there and write papers and talk to professors and um, do my class projects. Anything I needed to do it was very just smooth transition. And then when I went to law school, it was the same thing. It, there was really, everybody else felt like it was the hardest thing they'd ever done. And it was hard, but it wasn't anything compared to having to perform class plays and um, <laughs> some of the other things we have to do at Walder School. And so it just, it just flowed so smoothly. And it made me feel so happy that my parents chose this education for me. And I, knew, I know that they sacrificed a lot to send me to a Waldorf school for 13 years. Um, but I know I'm still experiencing the benefits of that choice of theirs. Thank you. Yeah, so my experience is probably a little less relevant because um, it was on a different continent and I graduated high school in 1992, so it was a different time as well. But um, so similarly to, to Julia, I went um, to Waldorf, you know, all the way through, um, uh, through 12th grade. And um, so my transition was also, you know, going to university um, uh, in Europe. And 
I have to say that was also, it was a very smooth experience, um, but it was also a little bit frustrating for me. And the frustration was in that I thought that after having gone through Waldorf, I was now going to be exposed to the big world where, you know, the really interesting stuff was happening. <laughs> And that was a little bit, um, you know, of a, of, of a wake-up moment for me where, you know, I, I, I thought that many of the professors would be, um, you know, have a, have a whole level, a whole different level of, of teaching and understanding of things. And I, you know, when I had that experience, I came to actually experience or appreciate even more um, the education that I had enjoyed at Waldorf. Yeah, so I went to Marin Waldorf School here for kindergarten through eighth grade and transitioned uh, into Tamil Pius High School uh, in Mill Valley, our local public high school. And I think, you know, you can kind of break it down into the different uh, pieces. I think, you know, socially, you know, at Marin Waldorf, I mean, we were a family. And my class is, is still, I think, the largest class ever to graduate Marin Waldorf uh, in history, 26 kids, um, 16 of whom... Uh, were in my kindergarten class. Um, we started out with 28 in the first grade and went down a couple. But, um, you know, having come from that sort of environment with 26 kids into going into an environment with 1,100 uh, in a school, right, so about, you know, a couple hundred per grade, um, enabled everyone, me and my two Marin Waldorf classmates who went to Tame High and everyone else who went to every other school uh, in the county, um, to really integrate and find our own communities, um, whether that be uh, the Tame High Drama Program or the music program or the cross-country team or the tennis team or uh, language arts. So, you know, finding those communities after being in such a close-knit Waldorf community uh, was really powerful uh, for me because it enabled kind of continuing that sort of community mindset. Um, I think in terms of academics, um, the transition was uh, absolutely seamless. I think. Uh, in terms of, you know, language arts, uh, I mean, Julia referenced this in terms of reading and writing. I mean, the ability to write uh, was something that most of my classmates had not really gotten from, from public or private education that they had come from. And that was something that was really important uh, here at Marin Waldorf uh, in our class. So I think that especially um, was a smooth transi transition. And in terms of the ability... Um, uh, I mean, it's already been referenced, but the ability to get up and, and stand in front of a class and actually present, um, you know, was something we did every day. Uh, we did it with birthday verses every week starting in the first grade, right? And so, you know, uh, we put on plays. Well, being in a play at Tam High was, was natural because that's what we did every year anyway, right? It was part of the education. So, yeah, definitely, definitely a smooth... Uh, transition. And after that, you know, going to UC Santa Cruz and LSE for grad school, I mean, you know, uh, again, um, you know, there were, there were students who were, you know, at, at similar levels in some respects, but I think, I think the depth uh, and richness of Waldorf education uh, meant that when I met someone uh, in college or in grad school who had gone to a Waldorf school, it was like a kindred spirit, you know, even if they had gone to a Waldorf school, you know, in, in another country or another state, um, it was like, oh, we have this, this bond, and, and that bond is, is something that's really rich and that we carry forth uh, into the world. Do some you with me hellos there. Yeah, the secret to handshake. Um, so I'll just focus on on two points in my transition from Summerfield Waldler for ninth grade into the public high school Petaluma High for tenth grade, where I stayed through the the remainder of high school. Um, so on. I guess overall, I would say I found a, a really good niche within the honors and AP classes when I when I transitioned into the public high school. Um, but two things stood out to me. So one was on the transition of my math curriculum. So I know this is often a, a topic that most people are interested in when when thinking about Waldorf School. Um, and so it was. It happened to be that I was in. I was finishing, I guess, algebra one, um, and my honors and AP counterparts were a, a class ahead of me. So they were gonna get to, to calculus by senior year. Um, and so we were thinking, oh gosh, is this, you know, is this a problem? It was, not, it was not a problem at all, right? I took two classes, sophomore year. I took geometry and algebra two at the same time. Um, 
and my counselors were worried that I was going to be overloaded, I found that it was an incredibly smooth transition because I would spent the time and had the discussions and the two-way kind of dialogue with my math teachers to really understand and discover the foundational mathematical principles. So I got it. I didn't have to memorize things, right? And so then I was able to accelerate from there and, and kind of catch up and then surpass some of my peers. Um, math ended up being you know, very easy for me through high school uh, and beyond through college. Um, and I think that that was because we spent a little extra time here at, at, at Marin and at Summerfield to go really deep on the, the foundation. Because then, then you can build on a strong foundation. So that's one thing. And the other thing I noticed, um, even while in high school, um, was a switch from the value being put on the learning itself and the, the process, the journey, to the value being put on a GPA. I'd say that that was one of the big downsides I saw from switching. Um, the sole focus came to, I need this GPA to get into the college that I want to get into. Um, and later in college, taking psychology classes, there's a lot of research around when you value an extrinsic goal like that, you lose the value intrinsically of the process. And that I felt very strongly um, and made me really value the evaluation that happened at Waldorf, which was much more holistic and much more kind of integrated into the process itself as opposed to an endpoint. I was going to also talk about that, but you did already. Um, I went to Marin Academy after Waldorf, which is another exceptional educational experience here in Marin. And the transition was actually incredible. The first semester there, it was a little bit of adjustment. Um, I got B's instead of A's, not the end of the world. But socially, it, I fit right in. Um, all of my teachers always commented on how grounded and centered I seem for a freshman. I was jumping on the opportunities to go camping and do all these other extracurricular things a lot sooner than some of my other you know, students in my class were. So I just, and I also loved my experience there, and I think Waldorf prepared me flawlessly for it. Took a little bit to transition to the GPA based, but really only a semester. And I was as pretty much, you know, got great grades the rest of the time through. And then when I went to UCLA, that transition just went off without a hitch. And I jumped right into the complete opposite way of evaluating where you just memorize from a textbook and answer multiple choice questions, which is, you know, not anything I'd done up until that point. But I'd been so well prepared to handle whatever was thrown at me that I just figured out and adapted and did really, really well at UCLA as well. So I think just Waldorf taught me how to juggle whatever it is that comes my way and find a way to think creatively about it and problem solve to succeed. So awesome. it was great. Thank you. If you can stay with the mic, I'll stay, I'll stay with you. Um, so now we'll transition into career. Um, so if you want to just maybe continue that, right, so after, um, and then you've done a couple of entrepreneurial ventures, um, which has a different skill set of itself. Um, can you talk about maybe some of the, you know, basis from here uh, into your sure. current career uh, and, and into maybe entrepreneurship? Yeah. Um, well, I've done a couple different things, but they've all been in the realm of helping people. Uh, Waldorf definitely instilled me with a great passion for being of service and wanting to see people succeed and thrive and especially holistically because that's how I was raised with my education. My mind, body, and spirit were all nurtured here and that's how I've wanted to help people. So I started a health coaching, holistic health coaching business out of UCLA and I did that for six something like that years. Um, and then when we moved up to the Bay Area, I took a couple years off work. We have a two-year-old, so it's fun. I'm here as both a prospective parent and an alumni. Um, and recently, now that parents are my, you know, my cohort, I've become a pediatric sleep consultant because I'm passionate about helping parents with their mental health and getting sleep <laughs> and all of that. So... All of that, I think, really does boil down to my education here, where it really taught me to 
get genuine connections with people. I love working one-on-one with individuals and to see people as, you know, in their whole sense, not just look at them as little individual things, um, but see really where they're suffering, if it's spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, And also, although I have yet to make a career out of it, I developed a strong love for travel and service abroad while being here. Uh, It started, I think, just learning the mythology in the early grade school. Um, I just have always been so interested in different cultures, and we had such a rich education in that here. So any opportunity I had throughout high school and college, I studied abroad in Ecuador, Costa Rica, Italy, and I think somewhere else, but I, and I got to do service work there and learn about other cultures and be immersed in that is a lifelong passion that definitely started here. Thank you. Marissa, so similar question. Um, and what's fascinating about your, um, just to kind of maybe touch on a connection from the class trip from here um, that then inspired uh, some other work that you got into before your current career at Deloitte. Um, maybe if you can kind of talk about, about those experiences and what those uh, similarities of drawing from here yeah. were. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had mentioned that we went, our, our class trip, we went down um, to Guatemala on a service trip. So um, kind of drew on some um, some trade skills within our our parent network, um, had done a lot of fundraising, Uh, went with our Spanish teacher and some other teachers down and and, um, went out into some small villages outside of, um, oh gosh, let's see, there's a village called El Tejar, out out in the rural area um, in, uh, outside of the the main city in in Guatemala, Guatemala City. Um, And I would say that I, I mentioned that because that was a really, um, I would say, jarring uh, experience and then also really powerful and transformational experience. And I'm so grateful for it to have been part of the kind of culmination of my time here at Marin Waldorf. So it was right at the end of our eighth grade. It was, again, thank you. I, I don't think we had quite as many uh, folks stay all the way from first grade to eighth grade, but we had a, a, a long kind of um, deep relationship within, or I, I did with my classmates and, and the teachers and parents who went down there. Um, so it was a really wonderful way to kind of cap the the experience here at Marin. Um, and uh, it was definitely, I was telling these folks before we started here, it's definitely not not glamorous by any means. It was, um, it was an it was an experience, I'll say that. Um, and it was, um, but it, it allowed me to see uh, parts of the world that I had never seen. I've been, uh, traveled a little bit internationally, um, but never to, uh, I'd never seen the poverty that I saw there, right? So I grew up in, in Petaluma and, and went to school in Marin, and we are very blessed with a lot of things around here, um, but that opened my eyes to how different people live and uh, work and the the kind of idea sprung from there of kind of thinking through what it you know what does economic development mean what is you know the value of dollar and the disparity of dollar between um, the U.S. and and the oh gosh I don't remember the uh, Guatemalan uh, currency Um, but what does that parity or disparity look like what is what are the factors and drivers of um, development in one area, one country, one you know culture versus another? And trying to understand and wrap my head around that was really um, it got me thinking and it kept me thinking for a long time. Which is ultimately I, I ended up uh, majoring in international de- development studies at UCLA as well. Another another brewing up here, um, and so that major essentially took a a look at development economics, but within a social, political, um, geographical context. So it tried to kind of um, think beyond just kind of Chicago School of Economics, economic core theory, or um, or w- what I would say is more a traditional theory, um, and, and put some context around it to say, what else is happening? What else um, 
is not in those classic models. So I'll stop there before, if I'm happy to talk more about that afterward. Um, but I'll say that, yes, there was definitely a, a direct line where I kind of the, the interest was sm sparked here on that trip for the first time. Um, and then that grew into this, this interest that I continue to explore through undergrad. Um, I feel like I've talked for a bit. I'll just say one more thing um, in terms of next steps. I'd just like to share a quick anecdote um, about how Marin Waldorf has, has affected kind of my career progression after that. And that was at business school, so at, at, at uh, University of uh, Michigan a couple years ago. I was a peer coach, so I was coaching the underclassmen who were recruiting for consulting, which is about a four-month process. Um, so I was kind of taking a, a cohort through the process and helping them figure it out and, and get prepared to, to get whatever job that they, they want to get. Um, and I had this really strange, I thought it was strange, um, moment where my class asked, my, my cohort asked for some help on um, figuring out how to do networking events. So there's networking events, people from the company that you're interested in working at, show up and you have to go talk to them. So you have to introduce yourself and have a conversation. Um, and so they, they actually said, how do I do this? Um, and it was far beyond you know, shyness, outgoingness, that it was beyond that. It was, I don't mechanically know how to do this. Um, and it's so terrifying, I can't. Um, and so I actually thought back at the time to my time at Waldorf and how much the teachers valued my opinion and respected my opinion as a, as a peer and an equal, where I was used to interacting with adults in a respectful and um, kind of fully empowered manner that I think a lot of people were not. That's at least my root cause analysis. Um, it, it's obviously through my own lens. But um, I thought that that prepared me to um, kind of be able to walk up to anyone, even if I, I am a shy person, but walk up to anyone and have the um, foundational kind of confidence to know that I can have a conversation with a CEO or whoever it is, because they're all human. Thank you. Same question. Yeah. Um, I completely agree in terms of the ability to interact with anyone and have, you know, your voice. Um, carry as much weight as, as theirs. I think that, you know, at Marin Waldorf, um, in seventh grade, our teacher, uh, then Ann Cummings, now Anna Jacopetti, um, asked our class, you know, who, who would like to take on an environmental project? And a couple people raised their hand, and, and she said, well, I think I have, I have two in mind. Uh, the first is, why don't we see if we can get some solar tube technology installed uh, in our classroom? Here, just right down there, in our seventh grade classroom. And the second was to start a reusable cloth bag business and donate the proceeds uh, to Greenpeace. So I raised my hand for the first one and over the next uh, six months um, wrote a proposal uh, to the Dixie School Board, uh, the Dixie School District Board, uh, now uh, Miller Creek uh, School District, uh, asking you know, if the school board would let Marin Waldorf and our class install uh, the solar technology in our classroom. And, you know, having that experience of actually writing a real proposal to a real school district body, um, you know, and, and sending it in and, and having the feedback and having that be something that I was not graded on, that was not something that was a class assignment, but was something that I offered to do because it was put out there. Um, was an amazing experience, and you know it, it didn't result in solar tube technology being installed in the classroom. Uh, maybe something for a new seventh grader to take on at Marin Waldorf, uh, you know, 14 years later. But you know, 15 years later. But um, you know, uh, the fact that I was empowered to do that, and encouraged to do that, and mentored, and given the opportunity to do something that was real, that was not busy work, that was not sitting, you know, at a desk and filling in, you know, scantrons and, you know, fill in the bubble, you know, multiple choice tests, but was actually given an opportunity to do something real uh, that actually affected um, the real world uh, was, was, was empowering. Um, other people took on 
uh, that bag business um, in eighth grade uh, after my solar tube technology project uh, was finished. I got engaged with that as well. Uh, other people took on, um, you know, planning efforts around our eighth grade field trip to Catalina Island in Santa Barbara. So there was, you know, abilities to, there, were, there was opportunities to actually take on leadership roles um, through our class meetings every Friday, through uh, special projects um, that I think uh, have, have lived with us as we've transitioned into uh, careers. And, you know, uh, like, like you were saying, you know, I mean, you, you sit with people and, and they're just human, right? And you've interacted. I mean, I remember in fourth grade, um, you know, Ms. Cummings going, oh, you should come hang out with the kids, you know, because I would be hanging out. Um, Ms. Deason is nodding her hand, her head, because uh, I probably hung out with you. Uh, but, you know, I'd go hang out with the teachers and go hang out with the, with the parents, um, and I wasn't the only one. There were other students who did, too. Um, and that was because, you know, there was no kind of, you know, oh, here's the parents, and here's the teachers, and here's the kids, and here's the lower grades, and here's the upper grades. You know, I mean, you kind of knew everyone, and it really was almost like a, a workplace or a family uh, in that sort of way. I'll just leave with, uh, with, with one last anecdote. Um, it doesn't have to do with a career, but it has to do with kind of our Waldorf family in that last year... Um, uh, someone, uh, probably the fourth or fifth person in our class to get married, I uh, got married last year in Virginia. And I went to the wedding, and, you know, m me and my best friends in seventh grade, Theron, uh, biked from Washington, D.C., 60 miles into Virginia to the, to the wedding, and we all stayed in the, in, in the house for a couple of days. But, you know, uh, there were probably eight or nine people from our Waldorf class at this wedding. It was not a big wedding. There were probably more people from our Waldorf class <laughs> than there were of the two, of the couple's friends from college, you know, individually, you know, there were maybe like 30, maybe like 30 to 40 friends, I would say, between the two members of the couple, right? Between the bride and the groom, there were probably about 40 people. And nine of them were from our Waldorf class. And people came from Spain, people came from New York, people came from California, people came from Minnesota, all to be there at the wall, you know, of course, you know, but that's not something that happens in, in other schools. So that was just an anecdote I didn't want to forget. Thanks. Yeah, well, um, two, two things that I would like to mention um, around career. So um, one really important thing that I, um, that, that really helped me throughout my career um, has been the capacity that I think was instilled in me um, um, during those years at Waldorf of when something looks like it's binary, you know, it's either true or false, or it's either a one or a zero, or it's, you know, let, let, I won't go into politics, right? But you, you know what I mean. So, um, and we have so many things, you know, around that, that um, there's, there's a third way of looking at it, and that's not the point in between, it's not the compromise, but it's just tilting the whole thing and looking at it completely differently. And um, that is something that I really, really value because it helps um, to take a step back, to look at things differently, and to find um, creative solutions. Um, you know, I, I had all the, the drawing and painting and, you know, handwork stuff that we have in Waldorf School. That wasn't my strength, but it helped me to um, start thinking creatively, um, which um, I really, really, really am grateful for. So that's one thing that has really helped me throughout my career. The second thing I want to mention is, um, I, I guess most of you at some point in your life have either been hired into a job and have maybe also made hiring decisions. And whenever in my job I make a hiring decision, I do not ask people, so tell me what age you were when you started reading. I've never asked that question. <laughs> I've also not yet asked anyone tell me when you were able to recite the seven times table. You know? what, I'm, what I'm looking for is, is a couple of, of other things. It's um, courage, it's compassion, um, it is resilience. Um, and 
You know, when, and, and those are, are life skills um, that, of course, somebody needs to be able to recite the seven times table. I mean, of course, and be able to read. I mean, of course, but that, you know, we'll get there. Um, everybody gets there. Um, the, the question is not so much when, but the question is, um, I think, um, at what point is the individual ripe, basically, in their development to make that step? And uh, those other qualities, honestly, are what I think we need. I mean, if you look at the problems, at the challenges that we have, whether it's climate, whether it's social justice, whether it's how do we figure things out together um, rather than you know, go back to a, to a binary model, um, th those are the solutions that I'm looking for. And that's also the case in a business or in any organization. Um, things happen. And then, how do we respond to the things that happen? Do we have the creativity? Do we have the compassion? Do we have the resilience to figure it out and to, to get to solutions together? Um, and I honestly, so let, let me just say, Waldorf is not the only path to get there, right? Not at all, not at all. But I do not know any other um, school system or approach that consistently turns out people who have those kinds of qualities. So along that same theme, I think it's men been mentioned before that when I went to college, I ran into a few other Waldorf grads, and I could always tell. They didn't have to say anything about Waldorf. I could always tell. And it's because Waldorf students are curious. They like to, they're willing to talk. They're willing to um, talk to the professor and they want to think, they want to know things, they want to explore the ideas of whatever is being discussed. And so it's every single time there was some student in the class who was raising his or her hand and asking questions and based on the quality of the questions, I could just, I always thought, hmm, that sounds like a Waldorf student. And sure enough, every single time it was a Waldorf student. And so I think Waldorf does imbue this sense of discovery and joy of learning that is just remarkable. And I'm now teaching here in the sixth grade, sixth grade math, which is so much fun. I love being back in school again. Um, but you just see it in the students. And when I've taught in either college or high school, the students, usually they're very well prepared, they're very smart, they're very, they try really hard. But there's a different quality with Waldorf students where they are engaged in a whole deeper level. They ask questions that are, make me think, um, that make me, keep me on my toes. I feel like I have to work harder as a teacher than I ever have as an attorney. And <laughs> my bag is heavier now that I'm a teacher than when I'm an attorney. Um, and I just, it's this joy and living of learning. It's like, there's life inside of these students and it comes from the education and it comes from the teachers here. The teachers, um, are remarkable and when I went out to college that's what I was looking for I was looking for professors who are like my Waldorf teachers and it was really hard to find but I did find them at Mills College where I had teachers who cared about me and were invested in me and saw me and that's what I was looking for I was looking to be seen and to have a relationship um, with my professors because that's what education was for me education was a relationship it was a discovery and it wasn't just a one-way street where they were giving me information that I th then memorized, recorded, and spit back on a test. And so um, I'm just so happy to be back here in, in Walter School. My um, children are attending here, and it's full circle for me after graduating from a Waldorf school. Also, my mom's a Waldorf teacher, so I, it's just in my blood. She always said I was gonna be a Waldorf teacher. And I said, no. <laughs> and I went out and became an attorney, and now look, I'm back here, so. <laughs> um, but the joy that is here in these students and in this campus and with these teachers, is just, you can feel it. And it's really remarkable, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. We have to so we always go over because this is so good and we changed something this year that all of the teachers who are with your children they know we're going over <laughs> and they're just loving them and taking care of them and if anyone needed anything i've seen miss lisa walk back and forth two or three times getting food from these tables for the children so i want to assure you they are all being taken care of and fed and loved and um 
we know we're going over. And so if any of you have to go, you can, but you really don't have to because they're all fine. They promised they would come tell us if someone needed their mom or their dad. They're not going to keep them down there um, if they need you. So we're going to open it up for questions um, and for just like, let's see, for five or seven minutes or so. And then here we go. Um, thank you for being here today. So I'm curious from your perspective, um, from being a Waldorf student yourself, and then I understand many of you have children in the Waldorf um, program. Um, I, I have two questions. One is, <clears throat> prior to discovering Waldorf, I had this opinion, like, why would anyone ever send their kid to private elementary school? Wouldn't you want to save that for high school and, like, zest them up before they go out into, like, you know the important big world, right? And I feel like my perspective has totally flip-flopped. And now I'm like, oh my goodness, maybe this is the most important time for early education and elementary school to keep their vitality and their creativity and their aliveness. So if any of you want to comment on why you think that's important having gone through it, and then as parents, why you're choosing this investment for your child's education at this time, that was question number one. Question number two was, when I was growing up, it was like, you go to this school to get good grades, to get into a college, to get to a good job so you can make lots of money so you can have a good life, you know? And there was no, like, who are you? And, like, where, what is your soul taking you? And, like, I feel like my 20s and 30s was, like, trying to just, like, extract myself from, you know, th this veneer of, like, just do this because this is what's successful. And um, I would love to hear about how maybe you didn't have to go through that, going through Waldorf. As, like maybe how has going through Waldorf uh, helped you to stay true to your authentic self and create and enjoy a life that's meaningful to you where you feel like you're contributing to the greater good? Being successful, yes, but like from this place of soulfulness. Well, I think they're actually, those two questions kind of go together. I think the beauty of Waldorf is that it's developmentally based. And I think it was accidental because Rudolf Steiner lived far way before any of the child development mentalists came about in the 60s and 70s. So almost all the research was done in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. Waldorf was created long before then. But if you, when I took a child development class in college, I was like, oh my goodness. The, Waldorf is based on child development. And it, they just knew. I don't know how. And so I think, especially with the lower grades where there's this pressure in public school to teach more earlier, I think reducing that pressure is, is very important. If I had to choose and only could send my kids to a few years of Waldorf, definitely kindergarten, first grade, second grade, as long as I could, but definitely in those early years where there's now this pressure to perform academically. Um, and I, there's no evidence that that works. There's zero evidence. In fact, I think it backfires. Um, and then I think that goes along with finding yourself. So about in Waldorf, it's about the teacher seeing you as a person. It's not, not about you conforming to what you are supposed to be as a student. And so there's always, the classes are small, you know your teacher so well. It's all about you as a person. It's not you having to perform, especially with no um, you know, A, B, C, D grades in the early grades. It makes a huge difference, I think. Yeah, thanks. I, I'll, I'll be really brief and just want to answer your first question. If you build a house, do you invest more in the foundation or in the roof? I, you know, that, that's the way I would look at it. Um, I think it really makes sense. And, and going back to, to the founder of Waldorf Education, Rudolf Steiner, he said the most important teachers, the teachers who should actually be paid the most, are the early childhood teachers, um, because that's where you lay the foundation. Yeah, um, I'll just say that, you know, I've never met anyone who went to a public school who enjoyed middle school. Okay, <laughs> Mi Middle school was maybe my favorite part of schooling for kindergarten through grad school, right? The field trips, the, the friend, you know, the, the true friendships that were made here, right? Um, and I was here kindergarten through eighth grade, right? But I think that you know, the fact that you avoid that kind of middle school environment 
um, and you don't really have middle school. Yeah, you're in the you know orchestra with with the middle school, but you know <laughs> it, you're not you're not in that sort of environment um, that that you get other places. That I think is is truly powerful. And I think uh, you know as as Jasper was saying in terms of you know the the grounding and and as you were saying in terms of the the child development. I mean, I was chief of staff of Community Action Marin, which runs all of the Head Start programs uh, in Marin County and most of the subsidized childcare programs. And our best sites, when I would go there, I'd be like, oh, this is just like Waldorf. And the ones where I'd be like, ooh, uh, there's some you know things we need to change. Those were the ones I was like, oh, this isn't like Waldorf, you know. But I was always comparing it to my experience here, um, which was which was. You know, I think a testament to how powerful um, that experience in like a Waldorf kindergarten is, even at, you know, I'll be 20, 29 in a couple of months, right? I don't need to weigh in on this one. Um, hi, I really loved what you said about um, courage and compassion and how Waldorf consistently creates um, individuals with that uh, quality. Is there something about, you know, the education that you think um, creates, you know, more compassion, more courage. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question, and the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I think the um, so not seeing education as um, filling up a bucket with water, right? Or, or you know, as we were talking a little bit before we started, um, you know, a, a, a blank slate and kind of filling in the blanks, um, but really an interaction between the teacher and the student and recognizing that um, there's, you know, it's not a one-way street, but um, the, so, and, and that development, um, I think, um, really instills the compassion and also the social process between the students that's really encouraged and you know uh, our two daughters are in middle school here now and they you know they work through social ethics and you know they they th so there's a lot of of infrastructure that's being offered around how do you how do you build that compassion how do you um how do you work things out how do you deal with conflict um all of those things and uh, around courage i would say um I think it it really goes back to the early years, um, and um, you know, I think that's where the foundation is being laid of um, feeling that you're comfortable in your own skin and um, you're great the way you are, um, and we don't need to tweak you or change you as a human being. There are things that you need to learn, but as a human being, we're going to help you become what what's really, you know, inside of you already. And so, you know, Waldorf is not a, a method, you know. Uh, when, whenever I hear, you know, Waldorf-inspired education, I'm thinking, okay, so is that, what does that mean, right? Whereas a, 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 a true Waldorf school, so to say, has, you know, the teachers have a different view of the students and of the children. Um, they're not applying a method um, and then um, doing something else. And then I, I think that in the end makes a difference. Um, on the point of courage, I think one of the things that that makes me think about was all of the exploratory learning we did where there wasn't necessarily a right answer or a defined objective, it was how do you figure it out? Um, and so one anecdote that comes to mind is one morning in eighth grade while we were studying the Industrial Revolution and mechanics, um, Mr. Hines, my teacher, came running in and he was very excited because one of the parents had gotten a flat tire out here. Um, and he said, we're going to go learn how to change a flat tire. And he handed us the car keys and he said, go, do it. And so we, we got some parent's car, <laughs> uh, and it was our, our job to go find, you know, we figured we'd just been learning about levers, and so we figured there's got to be some way to lift this car up, because we're not doing it, right? So there's got to be a jack in there, and so we had to go try and figure out where the jack was, and then how to use it, and then how to change the tire. Um, we did change the tire, and uh, I think it took the whole main lesson block, but we changed it. Um, but I think when you have an environment where exploration and 
I hesitate to use the word failure, but like not getting to the originally intended outcome is part of the process, then the idea of failing becomes far less scary. Um, if you think of Google Moonshot Company, they, they're all about like how do we, how do we free, reframe failure as a step in the process? Um, and I think that's, that's very much integrated into the, 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 the way we learn here. I'll just add two cents, which ties back into your question about kind of growing up with that sense of soulfulness um, and courage. Like you were saying, Jasper, just the way that your teachers treat you and um, you just kind of know from an early age who you are and that is really fostered and developed. So even though I haven't taken a traditional career path, something that I have always done has been true to myself. And from a very young age, I felt like I had my authentic voice before maybe some of my peers did and really had a sense of who I was. And you know, it's really only kind of now that I'm sitting on this panel that I really am seeing how much of that came from my relationship with my teachers early on and being treated as a complete person and them believing in me even when I didn't in myself and fostering my strengths from a very young age. And because I kind of knew who I was, I've had the courage to do things kind of my own way and it's worked out beautifully in my life to your point. So it's been very, very important to me in my life to stay true to that over meeting all these other externally imposed ideals of success, but really what fulfills me and who am I and how can I serve in this world? Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, without getting too personal, we all know that in a classroom there's always children who grab a concept a lot quicker than others. Um, and then there's some children who therefore get a bit bored because you know, for them it's not going fast enough. Then there's on the other side of the spectrum children who it's going too fast for them. So without getting too personal, how did you feel that you know, that was catered to you in, in the classroom or to your children? How do you feel that some children who we know are slower in the classroom are given the opportunity to lead and, and be the leaders when, when there are other children who always want to be the leader and, and are quicker than everybody else, you know, get that. How do you see Waldorf catering to that? Well, I think it comes from the teacher. And I know, you know, for example, a class play. We had to do a class play every year. And there's always those children who are natural actors. And there's always those children who are not natural actors. But the teacher made sure that everybody had a spot. And sometimes the children who were not natural actors got the lead in the play. And they had to rise to the occasion. And they did. And I think that's true throughout the education, where teachers allow children to rise to the education the goal to whatever we're giving them, they will rise to the challenge. And so you see that all the time. And I think it's because the teacher sees the student, especially first through eighth grade, you have the same teacher for eight years. Those teachers know the children on such a deep level and they can help let that child blossom. However, that child's going to blossom. And you know, for some students, they do not wanna be the lead and th that scares them. but they're given the opportunity to lead and the opportunity to blossom. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a, just a, a few little things there. Um, our third grader is a, a ferocious reader. He went from not being able to read to suddenly reading Charles Dickens. And, and that, so he gets bored um, when the class is reading. And his teacher just gives him a really thick, harder book. He goes, here, go. So. I, I, you know, and on, on the other hand, um, you know, one, one of our children was slower, you know, with math and, um, and because of everything you just mentioned, then the class teacher figures out who was faster and says, you go help her um, figure this out. So I, I think if you take a step back, um, because the teachers really know the abilities of, of the individual students, um, that everybody benefits from that. Um, and I would certainly say that in the end, um, nobody's being held back. Um, there, there's, I've, I've not heard that or seen that or experienced that. Um, it's really the, the, the students that are moving a little bit slower that just get more support than they would otherwise probably have if they were just among peers with the same speed of learning. Just very briefly, I, I see this as maybe the best 
part of Waldorf education is that no one's held back and no one's pushed forward, no one's skipping grades and joining a new cohort of kids where you know they're a year, year and a half younger than their peers. Everyone's in the same, the same classes and learning the same concepts. Um, but that doesn't mean that everyone is necessarily at the exact same ability at the exact same time, but everyone has strengths and weaknesses. So the person who's the star of the play you know, or the the acting, you know, that's that's really what they thrive in. Um, you know, they're not necessarily going to be the best at math, and so having you know different students uh, take on you know different um, tasks at their own ability, but kind of go together and support each other, I think is is one of the huge benefits of Waldorf. <laughs> Did you have fun? That was the question. Yeah. My powered farm was the most fun. Oh, the third grade trip to the farm. Okay. Unfortunately, the moment has come where we're going to close the open house. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank all of you for coming. Thank you for your time. There's an amazing packet with lots of good information, so sit down with that and dive in. Um, and if any of you are interested in joining our school, come find me, call me, let's chat, come meet with me. It's all about relationships, so this isn't going to be all about online. Let's do it. Let's figure it out. And thank you. Good day. And we have a gift for all of you when you leave. Okay, great. Thank you. And we have a gift.